Hello and welcome to the Boston Structural Heart Course. In this presentation regarding the Cardiac Anesthesia Fellowship Lecture Series, we will be discussing the pathophysiology, echocardiography, and intraoperative management of patients who have ischemic mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation in general and ischemic mitral regurgitation in particular is significantly affected by the loading conditions and the anesthetics used in the operating room. It is one of the most challenging clinical undertakings for an echocardiographer or cardiac anesthesiologist. Therefore, we'll be discussing its specific etiology, algorithms of its intraoperative assessments using transesophageal echocardiography with two-dimensional and three-dimensional imaging, and the basis of these cl clinical decision-making algorithms. In the first part of presentation, we'll specifically concentrate on how it presents, how we assess it intraoperatively, and what is the basis of those clinical decision-making algorithms. In the second part of presentation, we'll take up specific cases and discuss the applicability of these algorithms and how far they can help us in making rational decisions that are patient-specific and are likely to improve patient's outcome and likely to prevent recurrence of ischemic mitral regurgitation, particularly regarding repair or replacement of the mitral valve. I hope you enjoy this thing and good luck. So let's go over the presentation that is ischemic mitral regurgitation, its pathophysiology and management. So this is the first part of the presentation in which we'll go over the echocardiography of a patient presenting with ischemic mitral regurgitation in the operating room. We'll go over the echocardiographic principles of assessment of severity as well as remodeling of the mitral valve apparatus and discuss the basis of the clinical management of these patients. In the second part of this presentation, uh, we'll be going over specific cases and checking the applicability of the algorithms or the various algorithms that are out there for management of these patients in the operating room. So the most, most common clinical conundrum is that we end up having a patient undergoing coronary artery bypass craft surgery who has unanticipated or anticipated moderate or more mitral regurgitation. Now the choices on the table are to either ignore it and in, in anticipation of improved uh, blood supply to the affected myocardial segments, improved contractility and hence resolution of ischemic mitral regurgitation uh, postoperatively. Second is to repair and to see whether the patient, you know, we are able to interrupt the vicious cycle of volume overload secondary to chronic mitral regurgitation, give the mitral valve apparatus a chance to reverse remodel and eventually become normal and therefore with the chronic and permanent resolution of the mitral regurgitation problem. And the last, but not the least, but the most radical and the most you know, sure way of treating mitral regurgitation and to prevent any recurrence is to do a prosthetic uh, mitral valve replacement. However, at the end of the day, uh, we end up having a brand new mitral valve with its antecedent problems such as, you know, stenosis and de degeneration and infective endocarditis and thromboembolism. And at the same time, we also uh, have to calculate the issues of you know, chronic anticoagulation uh, management problems in these patients. So it's not an easy decision one way or the other. And this being a common and a very long-standing clinical conundrum was addressed in a trial uh, of 250 patients uh, in a multicentric fashion, a randomized uh, trial of patients equally matched as far as severity of coronary artery disease and severity of mitral regurgitation to undergo repair or replacement. The initial trial was of uh, how, how do uh, the short-term outcomes, that's 30-day outcomes as according to the STS database, and later on a two-year outcome of surgical treatment options, either repair and replacement between these 250 patients. However, for the while there are many various and many and multiple nuances of the results and stratification of results of these trials, but we are more interested in the two-year outcomes of this trial, particularly so that relates to recurrence of mitral regurgitation after repair and replacement. As is obvious from this uh, slide that there was significant, uh, you know, uh, replace a uh, difference between these two groups as far as regurgita recurrent regurgitation is concerned, as you can see in this one. And when we get to this, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the thick and thin of this trial, it was found that the replacement group had a recurrence rate of only 3.8% and the repair group had a recurrence of 58.8%, almost 60 patients, 60% patients recurred. Now, this pretty much knocks the ball out of the park in favor of replacement. And also, repair group had more serious events related to heart failure and cardiovascular readmissions. I, I, I believe this kind of sets, uh, makes it very, very obvious and 
unequivocally in favor of replacement for patients with ischemic mitral regurgitation. However, when we get down to the more important part, and we found that patients with absence of post-repair mitral regurgitation had significant improvement in the quality of their life. So maybe a subset of patients who have chronic ischemic mitral regurgitation can benefit from ischemic mitral regurgitation. The question is, how do we identify those patients? And now also, they mentioned that in, even in this trial, that the, rever, re, that the repair group that demonstrated reverse remodeling had a better quality of life postoperatively also. And essentially, what well, the problem seems to be not with repair, but for the patients who, to whom it is most suitable for, which means, implies that repair is being subscribed more often to the patients who are even not suitable for, uh, for repair and, are benefic- and are, would benefit possibly from an outright replacement in these patients. So therefore, the problem may be oversubscription of repair option for patients with ischemic mitral regurgitation and not so as with the repair techniques. Now let's go over the outline of our talk. So initially we'll discuss the scope of the problem, the various presentation of ischemic mitral regurgitation, the echocardiographic perspectives of looking at mitral valve and the mitral regurgitation in patients who have ischemic MR, and lastly, uh, certain examples of intraoperative decision-making, how do we do that? Now let's go over the scope of the problem. So these are American Heart Association statistical update from 2010, which said that MR, that is mitral regurgitation, is the most frequent valvular disorder uh, uh, in patients over 70 years of age. And nearly in one in 10 patients more than 75 75 years of age has about moderate to severe mitral regurgitation. So one in 10, that's almost 10% patients more than 75 years of age have some amount of mitral regurgitation. Also, it's not an entirely benign thing to have asymptomatic mitral regurgitation because it is a vicious cycle. You have increasing MR that leads to increasing stress, leads to muscle loss and damage, leads to LV dysfunction, LV dilation, and then leads to more MR. So therefore, as the MR worsens, as the LV dilates, and as the LV dysfunction happens over time, the mortality in these patients goes up to 57% if they are left untreated. The other, you know, startling statistic is that surgical, of, the, of the, all the patients who have mitral regurgitation, who are high-risk patients to whom it is not subscribed at all, and it is only about 2% of these patients who have moderate to severe mitral regurgitation are selected for mitral valve interventions. So 50% of the patients who have moderate to severe mitral regurgitation don't even get subscribed to mitral valve surgery because they do not you know, qualify for this either because of their you know, prohibitive risk or comorbidities because of that. So it's a, it's a huge problem which is likely to grow over time as the population ages and as, and as we get to even more later stages of their life and we'll be encountering these patients more often. So only 2% are reported for mitral valve surgery. So approximately 1 million Americans have an MI every year and 8 million have history of MI. And functional mitral valve incompetence due to adverse remodeling develops in 50% of the patients who have mitral, you know, myocardial infarction. And moderate MR eventually sets in about 10% of these patients as we talked about that. So this is a significant epidemiologic problem and it is not something trivial that is uh, that we encounter in the operating room once in a while, it happens more often than we think it does. Yeah. So the most important thing that we come across in this one is the definition or the difference between ischemic and functional mitral regurgitation, often confused. And mitral regurgitation should be considered functional in states of global left ventricular dilation, secondary to dis- systolic dysfunction, regardless of what etiology. So f- Functional MR is a global lovely problem, which leads to global LV dilation and therefore malcoaptation of the leaflets and leading to mitral regurgitation. So regardless of what the etiology of that global dilation could be ischemia, which is referred to as functional mitral regurgitation. Ischemic connotation should be reserved for mitral regurgitation that is due to a more localized left ventricular remodeling secondary to coronary artery disease, which means when there's a localized wall motion abnormality leading to malcoaptation and tethering of the leaflets, that sh- connotation should be reserved from ischemic mitral regurgitation. Therefore, ischemic MR is a subset of functional MR that represents leaflet malcoaptation in a locally dysfunctional LV or the mitral valve apparatus.
So pathophysiology of ischemic mitral regurgitation consists of valve leaflet and chordal structures are innocent bystanders in this, you know, uh, in, in this remodeling. The regurgitation is due to papillary muscle displacement, leaflet tethering, reduced closing forces, and annular dilation. Like I said, the valve leaflet and chordal structures are innocent bystanders. They have no abnormality, only they are being kept to do their normal function, and that is to coapt in the middle of the valve during systole to maintain systolic competence. So therefore, as, as uh, in this uh, beautiful graphic, it's being enunciated that mitral valve competence and non-restriction during diastole is essentially a balance between closing and opening, closing and tethering forces. So as, soon, as long as the closing forces override the tethering forces, the mitral valve remains competent. And as soon as the tethering forces, because of alveolar remodeling, LV remodeling, pull the leaflets in the more apical dilation or lead to annular dilation. Leaflet tethering and annular dilation leads to malcoaptation and therefore uh, uh, significant mitral regurgitation. So it's essentially an imbalance between the closing and the tethering forces of the mitral valve. Now, as I said, that leaflets and the cord tendon are innocent bystanders. This is ischemic mitral regurgitation is not a leaflet problem. It is an apparatus problem, and the apparatus consists of the left atrium, the mitral annulus, the corded tendine, the leaflets, and the underlying myocardium in these patients. And therefore, this entire leaflet problem is, as, is, not, is not an issue in ischemic mitral regurgitation. It is a problem with the entire mitral valve apparatus. So now let's go over the clinical presentations of ischemic mitral regurgitation. The three broad perspectives, the three broad categories in which we can encounter ischemic mitral regurgitation in the operating room as an incidental finding, as an acute finding, or as an emergent presentation. Acute presentation in the operating room per se is acute ischemia in a patient undergoing coronary artery bypass graft surgery. It's a dynamic MR uh, which is responsive to ischemic therapy. That's how I classify it. Incidental is unanticipated mild to moderate mitral regurgitation in a patient undergoing cabbage surgery. And lastly is an emergent presentation that is acute myocardial infarction leading to more than likely a papillary muscle rupture leading to severe uh, and torrential mitral regurgitation patient and patient presenting for an emergent coronary artery bypass graft surgery. Now let's go over a few incidental cases of mitral regurgitation. This is a 65-year-old male for three-vessel coronary artery bypass graft surgery. This is the mid-esophageal four-chamber view. You can see the ventricle function is not that you know, normal. It is significantly depressed, and there is some uh, mitral regurgitation with both a central and an eccentric component to it. As you can see, there are tethered leaflets. There is central MR. Uh, when you look at it in three-dimensional left atrial on fast view at this view, and left ventricular on fast view of the mitral valve demonstrating a coaptation defect, which is uh, right in the middle of A2 and P2 scallops. And if you look at the, you know, all the views of uh, the mitral valve and the left ventricle, uh, it's quite obvious that the leaflets seem to be normal. It's just, uh, you know, particularly the apical and the anterior segments of the left ventricle are kind of severely hypokinetic and the apex is almost akinetic. So it's a problem with the ventricle which is reflecting itself as a, a malcoaptation of the leaflets because of imbalance between the closing and the tethering forces leading to significant central mitral regurgitation. So it's normal mitral valve leaflets, this abnormal left ventricular remodeling, which has led to significant mitral regurgitation. Another clinical example is a 70-year-old female for three-vessel cabbage. You can see these tethered corded tendinae, which are pulling the leaflets more towards the apical displacement. And this particularly uh, cord, cord that is attaching to the belly of the anterior leaflet, leading to this classical seagull appearing, uh, you know, anterior leaflet, also known as uh, the seagull sign, which is uh, 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 quite indicative of significant adverse remodeling and tethering and apical displacement of the coaptation zone of the mitral leaflet. So this is left ventricular remodeling, leading to an imbalance between the closing and the tethering forces, uh, 
leading in this specific case leading to significant tethering of both anterior and posterior leaflet leading to central mitral regurgitation. So the tethering can be symmetric which because of bile leaflet you know restriction can leading to central mitral regurgitation or the tethering can be you know isolated to posterior leaflet leading to asymmetric tethering and therefore in this situation a posteriorly directed MR jet classically known as the Coendi effect. Now let's go over an acute presentation. The clinical example is a 45 year old male with acute myocardial infarction was reported to have severe mitral regurgitation and the patient was placed on an intraortic balloon pump uh, to support him hemodynamically and there was some suspicion of papillary muscle with the ferocity with which the MR suddenly presented in this patient undergoing uh, cardiac catheterization. As you can see, the, it is not necessarily a, a papillary muscle rupture, but significant tethering of both anterior and posterior leaflet with severely depressed systolic function, uh, which is leading to significant central mitral regurgitation. Another few views of uh, the mitral valve, one on the left demonstrating the, the transcommissural view showing you know, central mitral regurgitation jet, and a mid-esophageal long axis view also showing uh, significant mitral regurgitation, which is central, maybe with a slight posterior tilt. You know, interrogation of the pulmonary venous inflow demonstrates significant flow reversal in the left upper pulmonary vein, implying this is severe mitral regurgitation. Uh, when you look at the transgastric basal short axis view, or commonly known as the fish mouth view of the mitral valve, that quite clearly demonstrates the tethering of the leaf that's leading to a significant coaptation defect with central mitral regurgitation. Normally, you don't see this much, uh, you know, of uh, leaflet tethering that well and that classically in the transgastric basal short axis view, but in this patient, this pathology is quite easily visible in the form of this bilateral leaflet restriction. When we look at the left ventricle, as you quite predictably, the ventricular function is severely depressed, it is dilated, and the anterior and and posterior inferior wall are significantly hypokinetic, almost akinetic. And if you look at this, the septal wall seems to be slightly possibly dyskinetic as well. So this patient, uh, considering uh, the, you know, the tethering of the leaflets, the baseline, you know, abnormality of the leaflets, as well as the emergent or semi-emergent nature of presentation, underwent a mitral valve replacement with a mechanical leaflet. Now let's go with an emergent presentation. This is again a 70-year-old male with acute myocardial infarction, severe mitral regurgitation, hemodynamic instability, again was placed on an intraortic balloon pump for hemodynamic support and was quite predictably found to have a papillary muscle rupture which is attached to the anterior leaflet. As you can see, this muscle flapping around in the left ventricle and prolapsing into the left atrium during systole. The left ventricle is hyperdynamic, there's tachycardic to account for the uh, uh, short stroke volume, there's flail of the anterior leaflet with a, with a torn papillary muscle. While it's, uh, you know, in this uh, view, it's easy to appreciate that coaptation defect that is that was as a result of the prolapsing uh, papillary muscle into the left atrium during systole. There's torrential MR, which is posteriorly directed as you can see that is going away from the anterior leaflet and wrapping around the entire wall of the left atrium and returning back to the left, left, left uh, towards the mitral valve. Uh, classic Coenda effect which is underestimated. This is a surgical picture of the ruptured papillary muscle and obviously considering the acute nature of this presentation, the myocardial infarction, the ruptured papillary muscle, this patient had a mitral valve replacement with the bryoprosthetic valve since he needed a quick operation in and out of the operating room, not a long time of the bypass, so repair was not even an option in this patient. So the clinical dilemma, should there be a surgical intervention? If so, what should it be? Should it be repair or replacement? Very rarely we leave significant mitral regurgitation uh, alone in the operating room in, in anticipating you know, improvement in systolic function after revascularization. Now let's go over the echocardiographic perspective. So structurally, there are only three reasons that a mitral valve could be dysfunctional. In this specific case, dysfunction being defined as significant mitral regurgitation. 
According to Carpentier's classification that we've reviewed in our previous presentations, there's only three reasons that a mitral valve can be regurgitant. Type 1 dysfunction when the valve is moving normally, so either the annulus is dilated or there's a perforation in the mitral leaflet, or there's excessive motion, this is type 2 dysfunction, or there is restricted motion, which is the type 3 dysfunction. So therefore, there's only three reasons that the mitral valve can be regurgitant. Is it moving too much, too little, or normally? And each one of them has its own specific reasons. But the most important thing to remember is that ischemia can cause mitral regurgitation by all these three mechanisms. Through type 1 dysfunction, causing annular dilation. Type 2 dysfunction, causing papillary muscle rupture. And type 3, the most common one, being leaflet restriction or the apical displacement of the mitral leaflets. Therefore, ischemia in these three examples, as you can see, can cause annular dilation, acute ischemia causing annular dilation, leading to significant mitral regurgitation. Type 2 dysfunction because of papillary muscle, that is excessive motion. And lastly, ischemic tethering of the leaflets leading to type 3 or restricted mitral leaflet motion. So the pathophysiology of uh, mitral regurgitation in ischemia is functional valve incompetence due to myocardial injury and adverse ventricular remodeling. Like I said in the beginning, the leaflets in the chordae tendinae are just innocent bystanders in this whole process. And the quantification of remodeling has to be assessed in the context of mitral valve apparatus, not just the leaflets, because there are three components to mitral valvular remodeling or the apparatus remodeling in response to chronic ischemia and volume overload. One is this annular remodeling, number two is leaflet remodeling, and number three is ventricular remodeling, and we'll go through each one of these uh, uh, remodelings in, in, the f in the further sections. Now, how the annulus, di annulus response to chronic volume overload and ischemia, that is dilation, which means increase in the anteroposterior and septolateral dimension, but more than likely most likely to be anteroposterior dilation of the annulus, and number two, which is more complicated and more difficult to appreciate, and that's flattening or the loss of its non-planarity. Specifically, the annulus is saddled in shape. Now, the saddle, uh, for a multitude of uh, mechanical reasons, is supposed to reduce leaflet stress during, uh, leaf during a peak systole and preserve the leaflet integrity so that they can sustain that rise in left ventricular pressure. Now then, this is a very complicated subject, but to, to, to put it in, 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 in short words, the more saddle shape the annulus is, the less stress is on the leaflets. And the less saddling or the unsaddling of the annulus, and as it flattens, the leaflet stress tends to increase. As you can see, the non-planarity angle, that is the angle between the anterior and the posterior horn of the mitral annulus that is subtended at the commissural diameter is considered a... Uh, uh, a marker of the non-planarity of the mitral annulus, which means the smaller the non-planar angle, the more saddle shape of the mitral annulus. And the larger the angle, the more flattened the annulus is. And it is primarily uh, numerous mathematical computation models and in vivo uh, or um, animal studies have demonstrated that this is related to the gross engineering of the mechanical stress on the leaflets. And therefore, one of the uh, remodeling of the uh, uh, annulus goes in the form of dilation, more so in the anteroposterior axis, and at the same time, the flattening of the mitral annulus leading to more stress, mechanical stress on the leaflets that can be appreciated easily as, a, as an enlargement of the non-planarity angle. Now, the dimensions of the mitral annulus that are uh, you know, susceptible to this adverse remodeling are all of them, you know, AP diameter, annular area, posterolateral, anteromedial diameter, but the one that is most commonly impacted that is a dilation of the mitral annulus that is an increase in the anteroposterior diameter. At the same time, the annular dilation is quite heterogeneous. As we'll see, the remodeling affects the posterior annulus and in the later stages of ischemic remodeling, even the anterior part of the annulus, which is more fibrous, also tends to dilate over time. Then we come to left ventricular remodeling. I believe you have seen this uh, you know, animation in, the, in my previous presentation, but it is a very important concept that we need to appreciate in this sense that you can see that mitral leaflets, the chordae tendinae, the papillary muscles, the underlying myocardium are all acting in unison without any abnormality in their structure, keeping the mitral valves competent during systole and non-restricted during diastole, and therefore no mitral regurgitation. On the other hand, 
If this patient was to have a lateral myocardial infarction with an outpouching of the valve, and you can see there's a little splaying of the papillary muscles attachment leading to significant restriction of the leaflet. While there's no abnormality of the leaflet or the, or the cord tendony, but this time just because the tethering forces have has overcome the closing forces, there is significant mitral regurgitation. So the left, the, the ventricular remodeling is seen as leaflet tethering, and the more apically displaced the leaflets are, the more significant and more chronic this mitral regurgitation has been, and the more adverse the remodeling is. You know, so leaflet tethering is one of the most important uh, manifestations of um, you know, left ventricular remodeling. So to recap, the annular remodeling is seen as AP diameter dilation as well as flattening of the annulus. Left ventricular remodeling because of the, you know, abnormal geometry of the ventricle leading to, you know, outpouching and splaying of the papillary muscle in the coordinate tendon, leading to significant leaflet retraction and therefore the tethering forces overcome the closing forces leading to malcoaptation. So ischemic restriction is seen as apical displacement of the coaptation point, and the degree of apical displacement is directly proportional to the chronicity and the significance of mitral regurgitation. Now, this tethering and apical, apical displacement of the coaptation point in two dimensions is either seen as tenting height, which is the distance between the plane of the annulus and the point of coaptation, normally is about 0 0.6 centimeters. That has been reported in multiple studies. Anything more than that implies that there is significant leaflet tethering or tenting area, which is the area subtended under the, under the mitral annulus. Again, one centimeter square is considered the normal, and anything beyond that is considered an abnormal tenting area. Now, clinical scenario, as you can see in this one, there's severely depressed and dilated left ventricle. The leaflets are normal. They are coapting in the middle. However, as you can see, there's significant tethering and annular dilation, which is preventing or precluding the leaflets to adequate coaptation in the middle and the coaptation point is significantly apically displaced. Now in this situation, this is a ventricular problem. This is not a valvular problem. This mitral regurgitation does not need to be addressed at the leaflet level. As a matter of fact, quite particularly this patient ended up having a ventricular assist device because this patient needed a ventricular solution and putting in an anuloplasty ring or a, and, or, a, or a prosthetic valve in the mitral position would have resorted to an annular or a mitral valvular solution to what is, ex, is essentially a, a ventricular problem. Now, we go over intraoperative decision making in these patients. So, like we said, based on our assessment of the initial uh, you know, the papers in the New England Journal of Medicine that related to uh, randomized uh, trial of randomizing patients into either repair or replacement and following them over two years, it, it, it concluded at least one that there's li li little or no re recurrence with mitral valve replacement, but at the same time, repair seems to be over-prescribed, over-subscribed, and it's not an operation for everyone. We trade in a higher chance of recurrence for a questionable benefit, that's the key part. And the trick of this whole point is to identify the patient who will benefit from mitral valve repair in the form of having a, um, a favorable uh, you know, reverse remodeling and at the same time lack of recurrence, improvement in functional benefit and overall survival. So this was uh, one of the studies that we did with uh, our collaborators at uh, University of Pennsylvania in Groningen, in New York and Boston where we performed preoperative three-dimensional valve analysis on patients undergoing mitral valve repair for ischemic mitral regurgitation to see if there was any echocardiographic predictor that we could use to predict which of these patients are likely to recur after regurgitation. Quite predictably, we found that the patients who had recurrent ischemic mitral regurgitation demonstrated significant remodeling and tethering of their posteromedial portion of the mitral valve, which means both A3 and P3 were significantly retracted, and the P3, which is the posteromedial commissure P3 retraction angle was more than 29 degrees. So this was one of the most important, uh, uh, besides the tenting height and tenting area, the retraction of the P3 tenting angle was the most important finding in this one. And we demonstrated that, you know, preoperative 3D, to, uh, you know, to, uh, P3 tenting angle is a strong independent predictor of IMR recurrence at six months after annuloplasty than preoperative two-dimensional echo or transthoracic echocardiography. So the more regional 
the deformation of the mitral valve in response to ischemia, which means the more localized uh, the, is the remodeling is response to ischemia, the less likelihood that the patient will respond to a global solution such as an annuloplasty ring. So in this patients who have postromedial valve you know, tethering of particularly of P3 retraction angle of more than 29 degrees, something that can be easily measured on all high-end echocardiography systems nowadays, implies that this patient is going to be having more than likely a recurrence of mitral leaflet. So irreversible remodeling, which means a patient who has ischemic mitral regurgitation, if he has irreversible remodeling, is it possible to predict that thing? So now with these dynamic valve analyses and you know geometric indices that can be almost formed almost in real time, this has become pretty mainstream clinical operation, and this is something, a piece of information that we use in the operating room more than often than not, you know. And this is what we did was to demonstrate the regional heterogeneity in mitral valve apparatus in patients with ischemic mitral regurgitation. So what we demonstrated, what we sought out to prove was that even in those patients who do not have significant mitral regurgitation, there is significant ischemic remodeling of the mitral valve, and the ones did the ones, and we compared those patients who were non-regurgitant with those patients who had significant mitral regurgitation to the point that we had to resort to a surgical solution, either repair or replacement. So to find out which one of these characteristics truly differentiates the patients who have MR severe enough to cause, uh, to, to, to deserve themselves or to win themselves an annuloplasty or mitral valve replacement as opposed to the ones who are straight in coming for coronary artery bypass graft surgery but do not have significant mitral regurgitation. And lo and behold, what we found was it was again the P3 retraction angle even in those patients who had significant mitral regurgitation and the ones who did not was the one close differentiator for the ones who had irreversible remodeling causing mitral regurgitation as opposed to the ones who did not. But also we found was the fact that the non-planarity angle, quite predictably, was higher in those patients, as well as the anterior annulus length, which means when the mitral valve remodeling uh, occurs to a point that the anterior annulus begins to dilate implies that the remodeling is beginning to severe. So the patients who had IMR, who had significant mitral regurgitation, also had P3 tenting angle more than 29, larger non-planarity angle and a dilated or longer or elongated anterior part of the annulus as opposed to the patients who simply had coronary artery disease and were getting um, uh, cabbage surgery done. So this is, these three remodeling indices of remodeling significantly differentiate the people who do not have irreversible remodeling as opposed to the ones who, who have it. So therefore, now I believe we are getting to that level of sophistication in decision making where it's not the severity of mitral regurgitation, but the indices of the severity of remodeling of mitral annular apparatus that should be the end point of decision making in these patients. As such, we have uh, some unpublished data, which is under review right now, on the assessment of risk of mitral regurgitation in non-regurgitant mitral valves in ischemic cardiomyopathy based on structural mitral valve reserves. To cut the long story short, the background and objective of this thing was that the mitral valve maintains systolic competence with complex interaction of the components of mitral valve apparatus. There's a structural redundancy that we call the mitral valve reserve in the mitral valve apparatus to sustain ischemic related remodeling and prevent development of mitral regurgitation. Based on the available reserve, non-regurgitant mitral valves could vary in their risk of developing systolic incompetence that is mitral regurgitation. An objective of our study was to demonstrate that due to differences in structural mitral valve reserve, there is variation in the risk of developing significant MR in non-regurgitant mitral valves. The end point being both these valves, one with significant coaptation zone reserve and, and the other one with limited coaptation royal reserve are non-regurgitant. However, this valve has a significantly higher chance of developing mitral regurgitation as opposed to this one implying this has a much larger coaptation reserve as opposed to this one. Uh, this one has a much larger coaptation reserve as opposed to valve B, and therefore has more uh, uh, redundancy to sustain uh, adverse remodeling and still remain non-regurgitant. So in intraoperative, in these patients, we did three-dimensional tra three transesophageal echocardiographic images of the mitral valve were acquired in patients undergoing elective cabbage surgery with no MR and with ischemic mitral regurgitation. And therefore, we, we, we compared these two patients and you know, measured anterior length, posterior length ratio, 
leaflet reserve. This is the difference between the curved length and the linear distance between the annulus and the coaptation point. At the end of the day, we calculated the coaptation reserve of each valve uh, was unique and quite heterogeneous as compared to the other valve, even amongst the regurgitant valves within region 1, region 2, and region 3. So therefore, we calculated the coaptation reserve in region 1, region 2, and region 3, and therefore, and try to compare those valves that are regurgitant as opposed to the valves that are non-regurgitant. While I'm, there's not enough time to go over the entire you know, results in this one, this one, the blue lines represent the non-ischemic and the, the red ones, orange ones, represent the ischemic mitral regurgitation. So in all uh, you know, these valves, the ischemic, uh, non-ischemic valves had a, dip, had a better you know, uh, functional reserve as opposed to the ones that were not with the ischemic. However, in region 3, which is the posteromedial region, we found that the mitral valve reserve between these two leaflets was quite comparable, which means even the valves that were non-regurgitant just demonstrated significant posteromedial tethering, which was comparable to the ones that had ischemic mitral regurgitation, and therefore again pointing to the fact that the posteromedial region uh, of the valve uh, is the one that is the most, uh, the most likely to uh, determine whether this patient will have recurrent ischemic mitral regurgitation after analoplasty or not, which means if it has the posteromedial, that is the P3 scallop, is significantly retracted and the patient has significant mitral regurgitation, that patient is better off undergoing mitral valve replacement as opposed to mitral valve repair. This is as yet an unpublished data, uh, soon to see the light of day and uh, be published in a journal. So, Conclusions was that non regurgitant mitral valves vary in their risk of developing mitral regurgitation. Depletion of structural reserve is a regional phenomenon with posteromedial portion, that is the P3, A3, of the non regurgitant mitral valves at the most risk for coaptation failure. And depletion of mitral valve reserve is demonstrated by progressive posterior displacement of the coaptation point and absence of significant MR in non regurgitant mitral valve in ischemic cardiomyopathy does not imply normal mitral valve function. So which means even if the valve is non-regurgitant in ischemic cardiomyopathy, it does not imply that the valve is normal. It really depends on how much structural reserve it has to sustain adverse remodeling. In conclusion, IMR is a complex problem of the mitral valve apparatus and not just the leaflets. Annuloplasty in select patients can be successfully performed. 3D echocardiography has value not only in selecting and stratifying the patients for mitral valve repair or excluding them for this, this operation. And mitral valve apparatuses with regional distortions are unlikely to respond to global solutions, that is, annuloplasty ring. So this brings us to the end of our first presentation in which we go over the various pathophysiologies of development of, ischemic, of ischemic mitral regurgitation, the echocardiographic uh, you know, uh, interrogation of valves that are undergoing that have ischemic mitral regurgitation and the basis of the clinical decision making on three dimensional geometric impacts. In the second part of the presentation, we'll be picking up specific cases and try to see whether these indices as well as the algorithms that are developed to address these clinical situations can be successfully applied in the operating room to, to get to a rational and objective decision. Thank you very much and good luck.